Well, welcome everybody to this week's uh, acid-base conference. Uh, in the title, I have complex acid-base disorders. So uh, after having reviewed the simple ones, and by simple, I don't mean that the question is simple. I mean that there's only one acid-base disorder. So when people use the word complex, they're inferring that there's more than one acid-base disorder present. And uh, that's what we'll talk about. Uh, about today in some detail and give examples. So again, just to refresh the approach, when someone asks you what's the acid base diagnosis, you don't give a clinical diagnosis. You're now just talking about what the acid base chemistry shows. You immediately look at either the total CO2 or the bicarbonate from the blood gases and you decide is it increased, normal or decreased. If it's decreased, there's one of three choices metabolic acidosis or acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis. As I said last week, we tend to mention acute first rather than chronic and then acute, but uh, that's just a matter of preference. The reason for that is the acute occurs before the chronic does. So it doesn't quite make sense to mention the chronic first. Each of these is diagnosed not by the magnitude of the change in bicarbonate, since they all can have the exact same bicarbonate number. It can be, let's say, 19 in all of them, or 20 in all of them, whatever it is. And there's a there's a subtlety with that as far as acute respiratory alkalosis, because that can only go down a certain amount. Uh, and uh, I didn't mention that before, but if you think about it, if the PCO2 goes from 40 to zero, which you never see clinically, but let's say you ventilated someone down acutely from 40 to zero, that's a change of 40, which means the most the bicarbonate can fall is by eight from its original level, if it's more than that. So if you have a bicarbonate that's down more than eight from original level, or in other words, less than 17 or 16, it cannot be acute respiratory alkalosis just because the PCO2 can't go below zero. And for every 10 fall, the bicarbonate falls by two. So if it fell by 40, it means the bicarbonate's gonna fall by eight. You can't go below zero, so you can't have a fall more than eight from acute respiratory alkalosis. But everything above 16 or 17, you can't distinguish. So you look at the PCO2 change, and again, you calculate the change in bicarbonate from its original level versus the change in the PCO2. And these are the ratios you get. They're very different in each of them. Again, we don't use the Winters formula. And again, as I mentioned a number of times, this can be simplified to one to one. 1 1.2 to one isn't going to make much difference clinically. So. The simplest way is to just round this off and say the, the fall is equal as opposed to chronic respiratory alkalosis where the fall on the PCO2 is twice what the bicarbonate fell. Or the bicarbonate can be increased or the total CO2 can be increased. And again, it's either metabolic alkalosis or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. Again, the only one that has a limit is really the PCO2 um, because that, you know, we tend not to see PCO2s above 80 or 90. You know, if it went to 100, let's say, which would be life-threatening, the most the bicarbonate could go up is by is by 10, right? If the, for every 10, there's an increase by one in one. So if the PCO2 went up by 100, then the bicarbonate can go up by 10, which means the most it can be from acute respiratory acidosis is 35 if it started at 25. So again, the acute respiratory acidosis is just because of the limitations on what our PCO2 can be clinically, that limits what the bicarbonate can change by. But other than that, um, if it's less than that, you can't distinguish just based on what the bicarbonate value is. So don't make that mistake. A lot of people do. They say, oh, the bicarbonate's, you know, let's say whatever it is, 32, that must be a metabolic alkalosis. And that's totally incorrect. It could be any of the three. And you have to look at the, again, you look at the change in the PCO2 versus the change in the bicarbonate to distinguish which of the three it is. Now, as I've said before, if it's one of these three, then that's the presumptive diagnosis. But what would happen if you have an elevated bicarbonate, but and you look at these changes, and it doesn't fall into one of the three? Well, either you have another acid-base disorder present, or as I'll talk about shortly, you haven't reached a final steady state. 
And I'll talk about what that means uh, next. So in met we have and we haven't mentioned these time constraints before, other than in the respiratory acidosis. But, but the met in metabolic acidosis, for example, if you ask a resident or a, or a renal fellow, how long does it take till you get the complete compensation? as predicted by the Winters formula, if you still want to use that or the one-to-one -one rule, it doesn't occur immediately. It takes about, you know, half a day to a full day for the PCO2 to drop roughly what the bicarbonate fell by. So let's say you get ketoacidosis and your bicarbonate falls from 25 to 15. The PCO2 doesn't fall immediately to 30, roughly one-to-one. -one. It takes half a day to a day. Now, it'll start falling and you'll find this continuous change um, with time, but until it stops changing, will take up to a full up to a full day. It varies between people. It might take half a day in a given individual. But if you're expecting it to occur in the first hour or two, you're not going to see that. What you're going to see is the PCO2 has fallen a little bit, but not what you'd expect uh, in, in a fully compensated metabolic acidosis. And so you can get fooled into thinking that there's something else going on, even though you just haven't waited long enough. And that's something to remember for the rest of your fellowship. People always make that mistake. They think these things occur instantaneously. And, and if it's not the expected change that they expect, they get confused. And all it is really is you have to give it time. There's nothing else going on. There, it isn't a complex acid-base disorder. It's a simple acid-base disorder that has not had enough time to reach the expected uh, compensation based on population means. And the same is true in metabolic alkalosis, although it can take longer for the PCO2 to increase to its expected steady state. Remember for in metabolic alkalosis, for every 10 increase in the bicarbonate, for whatever reason, vomiting, barter syndrome, Gittleman syndrome, whatever it is, primary aldo, the PCO2 goes up seven tenths of that. So. If the bicarbonate went from 25 to 35, the PCO2, if it started at 40, should go to about 47. But to go from 40 to 47 doesn't occur instantaneously. It takes a day to a day and a half. And so if you came along in the first four hours after someone was vomiting and looked at their PCO2, it might be 42, 43, but it's not going to be 47. It just takes time. And again, it's not that you have a respiratory alkalosis in addition. You just haven't given the PCO2 enough time to reach its new steady state. So don't be fooled by patients when you don't have the expected compensation by writing on the chart, there's another acid-base disorder present. There isn't. It's the same. I mean, it potentially could be if you waited long enough, but you have to immediately look as to how long they've had it. Now, the problem in the clinical world is many times, unless it occurred in the hospital, you don't know how long it's been going on. You don't know when time zero is. But if you know time zero, you can then, as long as you're after this, these expected times, if you still have compensation that wasn't exactly what you predicted, then you do have uh, another acid-base disorder present, some sort of respiratory acid-base disorder, either alkalosis or acidosis, depending on whether the PCO2 was above or below what you expected. Chronic respiratory acidosis. So if I put you on a ventilator and all of a sudden I cut the ventilation in half, it's going to take three to five days for your bicarbonate to increase to the new steady state. Chronic respiratory alkalosis takes a shorter period of time. But again, it takes time for the bicarbonate to fall to your predicted level of two to one or half of what the PCO2 fell. So always remember for the rest of your fellowship, these times. And only once you've waited the appropriate time, can you then diagnose uh, a more complex situation where you have more than one acid-base disorder. So this just pictorially shows what happens in respiratory acidosis. You've seen this slide before where you have a PCO2, let's say it's 40, and now I suddenly instantaneously increase it Let's, let's say to 80. Well, the bicarbonate will go up suddenly, and that's just the bicarbonate buffer reaction that we've shown a number of times. This has nothing to do with organs. It just has to do with the bicarbonate buffer system that's distributed 
in all our organs. And again, there are other non-bicarbonate buffers involved too. The non-bicarbonate buffers, when, when you raise the PCO2, remember you generate bicarbonate and an equal molar amount, equal amount of protons, but the protons don't go free into solution or your pH will go to zero. The protons bind other buffers, but the bicarbonate doesn't. That's why we see a very small change in the pH but a much, much, much greater change in the bicarbonate concentration, even though both have been made equally. That, again, confuses people. So the bicarbonate doesn't, although you get this step increase because you've generated bicarbonate exactly if you've bubbled water with carbon dioxide, <clears throat> you do the same thing. The bicarbonate keeps increasing uh, until it stops changing. When it stops changing, we use the term a new steady state has been achieved. A steady state means that the concentration of the thing you're measuring does not change with time. So the derivative is zero, if you want to think of it in those terms. You keep getting the same number, even though you're changing time. And that takes, uh, when you raise the PCO2 or you're dealing with respiratory acidosis, that, that takes longer than if you lowered the PCO2. It takes three to five days, as you see here. And again, for every 10 increase in the PCO2, the bicarbonate steady states out at about three and a half higher than its original level. Now, remember that part of that increase was the bicarbonate buffer reaction. That's the acute respiratory acidosis rule. The remaining part is in addition to this initial amount. But when we talk about the chronic respiratory acidosis rule, we look at the total change, which is a little bit confusing because part of that total change was due just to a, the acute respiratory acidosis change. Now, this requires a kidney. We'll get into the mechanism as to what's going on uh, in another talk, but the kidney is actually generating new bicarbonate and of that extra bicarbonate coming through the glomerular filtrate, the kidney tubule is absorbing all that bicarbonate and not dumping it. So the, these two processes, the generation and the, the reclamation of the bicarbonate are two physiologic events in the kidney that prevent this bicarbonate from being excreted. If you don't have a kidney or you have no functioning kidneys, it will always look acute. And you always have to remember that, that even though the PCO2 has been elevated for three to five days, you will never be able to generate more bicarbonate or reclaim it at all. There's no other organ that can do this. And that also confuses people. So if you went into the dialysis unit, let's say people who are anuric and have no GFR, no kidney function, and you raise the PCO2, you would always get a bicarbonate that was only increased from the bicarbonate that was generated from the bicarbonate buffer reaction. You will not have this additional bicarbonate generation or reclamation. Now, this assumes normal kidney function. You will not get as much new bicarbonate generated or reabsorbed if you have CKD. So the worse your CKD, the worse this process will be. And it will, you know, you'll get a curve in between until you have, you know, complete ESRD, and then it'll just stay the same as the acute. Okay, so you can get all these kind of curves depending on on the level of uh, renal function. And conversely, if you drop the PCO2 acutely and keep it there, you will get this in immediate drop, which is the bicarbonate buffer reaction. So you drop the PCO2, the reaction goes towards the PCO2 side and you lose bicarbonate and a proton. You lose as much protons as you do bicarbonate, but your pH doesn't go to 14 because other buffers release the protons. But when you lose the bicarbonate, no buffers release bicarbonate. And so you get this fallen bicarbonate. It's the same thing that happens again if you open a bottle of soda. The PCO2 leaves, and if you were measuring the bicarbonate in the, in the, in the soda, it would decrease. But following that initial drop in PCO2 and drop in bicarbonate or total CO2, as I mentioned, most of the total CO2 is, is, total CO2 is bicarbonate. You get this continual fall in bicarbonate, and that also requires a kidney if 
you have no renal function, it'll just stay here at the acute level. This further fall requires a kidney and it's complicated as to why that occurs. And we'll, we'll talk about that at, at a later time. But the total fall includes, just like the respiratory acidosis, part of that total fall is solely from the acute fall. And the additional fall requires a kidney. So the total fall is such that for every 10 fall on the PCO2, this falls by five. So it's two to one. This falls twice with the bicarbonate falls. But part of that fall was from the acute fall. So let's look now at what happens when you're not in the steady state and how that can confuse people. So here are some numbers here, and I, if if you if you can, um, let me just move this out of the way here on my computer. Okay, so here's an 18 year old who came into the ER anxious, and what I'd like to do today is for everybody to write down what they think is going on. So again, look at the bicarbonate or look at the total CO2 of 19 and decide if it's increased normal or decreased and then look at the change in the PCO2 from normality and see which of the three acid-based disorders it fits into. I'll give, I'll give you a few minutes. Again, we're assuming normal numbers of 40 for the PCO2 and 25 for the bicarbonate. We don't know what it was in this patient, but it's a male, so we just assume the usual population averages. Okay, so if you can unmute and just tell me uh, in answer to this first question. Does okay, so this so this patient has either a respiratory or a metabolic acidosis, uh, sorry, alkalosis. Given the clinical presentation, um, it's probably respiratory driven. And for every 10 decrease, you have about a two to four, let's just say three. So that's six less. So from 25 minus six, Lines you at about 19 or 20, uh, 19 or 18. So this seems like a respiratory alkalosis with appropriate kidney response, not compensation. Okay, does any everybody agree with that or have any differences from what was said? Okay, this, everyone's on mute. Does that mean you all agree? I hope not long. So Sorry, my phone cut out there for a bit. Okay. Um, so looking at this, it looks like definitely some respiratory alkalosis. Um, although I don't think that's the only thing going on here, just because it still wouldn't cause the pH to be as high as it is at this point. Um, I think there's also like a mixed, um, or not a mix, I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm not exactly sure what the second one is because the bicarb is down by six, but I just feel like that's not, the complete appropriate response to this. So I think there is a secondary going on here, but to be honest with you, I don't know exactly what. Okay, so let me let me just back up a little bit because a lot was said. Again, um, try um, if possible, and I know it's hard to rid your minds of how it was done before in your training. Uh, the first thing you do is look at that bicarbonate and it's down. You don't Do not look at the pH. Because if you look at the pH, it's going to make you focus on that and make you make decisions or give you thoughts that um, may prevent you from actually making the right diagnosis and definitely uh, potentially miss uh, mixed disorders. So you look at that bicarbonate and it's down. And again, you just go through like a machine. It's either metabolic acidosis or acute respiratory alkalosis or chronic respiratory alkalosis. That should be the first thing you make your mind say. And then the next thing you look at is the PCO2 and the change from normality versus the bicarbonate and the change 
from normality. So, and you just go one by one down the row and see whether it fits metabolic acidosis, acute respiratory alkalosis, or chronic respiratory alkalosis. Again, go back to that slide where it's one of the three and just go from left to right for every patient that you see for the rest of your fellowship. So let's look at the changes. The PCO2 has changed by 20 and the bicarbonate has changed by seven. Is that compatible first with metabolic acidosis Im implication that it's compensated appropriately? Well, the answer is no, because again, in metabolic acidosis, it's compensated. The change in both those numbers has to be roughly equal. You can't have one changing by 20 and one changing by seven. So it's not compatible with compensated metabolic acidosis. Is it compatible with acute respiratory alkalosis? Well, again, we look at the changes from normal. So for every 10 drop in the PCO2, the bicarbonate falls one to two. Uh, you'll see different things in different textbooks. Um, let's say it's one. So if the PCO2 fell by 20, the most the bicarbonate can fall is by two, right? For every 10 fall on the PCO2, the bicarbonate falls by one. So it fell by 20, the bicarbonate would fall by two. Well, it's not compatible with acute respiratory alkalosis either. And then you're left with the last one, chronic respiratory alkalosis. And there, the rule is two to one for every 10 fall on the PCO2, the bicarbonate falls five. For every 20 fall, the bicarbonate falls by 10. So here you have a 20 fall, but the bicarbonate fell by seven. So, and again, remember, we have not looked at the pH and just cross out the pH from your mind because you make these diagnoses without looking at the pH. It's the best way, it's the best way to do it. Don't look at the pH and say it's elevated, so this cannot be a metabolic acidosis. You're, if you do that, you're going to miss mixed disorders, including the, a potential for metabolic acidosis being there. It's far better just to, again, look at those two slides. If it's down, it's one of the three. If it's up, it's one of the three. And you just proceed the same way, ignoring the pH. So here, after analyzing those three, we see it's not either of the three. It doesn't. It's not compatible with metabolic acidosis where the falls would be equal. It's not compatible with an acute respiratory alkalosis where we would have a one-tenth fall in the bicarbonate for every fall in the PCO2. And it's not compatible with chronic respiratory alkalosis where the fall in the PCO2 would be twice what the bicarbonate fell. So one possibility is we have a mixed disorder. But uh, the other possibility is we just haven't waited long enough. So again, we don't know how long this has been going on. We say anxiety episode, but this could have been going on for days. It may not be. And it certainly doesn't look like it's within hours or less than a day because these numbers don't fit acute respiratory alkalosis. If this was res acute respiratory alkalosis, the, again, the bicarbonate would have fallen by about two. It would be like 22, 23 but certainly not 18. So if it is due to hyperventilation or respiratory alkalosis, then the only, if we know that with metaphysical certitude, which we don't, but let's say we did, then we just haven't waited long enough. We're sort of in between the acute and the chronic phase. So if it was acute, as I mentioned, if the PCO2 had fallen by 20, this would have fallen by two. So it's not that. And if it's chronic, which is which means that we're in a new steady state after three to five days, then the bicarbonate would have fallen half of what the PCO2 fell. And the PCO2 fell by 20, we said. So the bicarbonate would be fallen by 10. It should be 15. Can't be 18 or the, or the total CO2, 19. So if we're right that this is due to chronic hyperventil or hyperventilation, We've got to be somewhere in between. So this is an example of a patient who was hyperventilating, but who wasn't in a steady state. We don't have clinical terms for things in between. But when you look at this diagram, you can see that you're going to get this difference in the, in the amount that the bicarbonate fell. The patient's sitting around here. But if we wait another day or two the bike, and measure the 
total CO2 or get gases every day and look at the bicarbonate, it's going to continue to fall, assuming the PCO2 is staying down at 20. So this is an example of what looks like a mixed disorder. Again, a mixed disorder being it doesn't fall into one of the three, right? It doesn't fall into one of, of uh, these three. And the simple thought is it's not only this acid-base disorder present. There's another one present. But it's also possible that it's only this, but we haven't reached a steady state. And that's, that's what's going on here. So if it was acute, as I mentioned, the bicarbonate would change one to two, so two to four. It's not clear exactly what it should be, but the most would be four. It should be 21. If it's chronic, the bicarbonate would fall another six, and it would be a total change of 10, but it's not. It's sort of in between here. So what you tell the resident is, let's just wait a couple more days. If the PCO2, this could be someone on a ventilator also, where they ventilated the patient down to 20. Let's wait a couple more days, and uh, we'll find that the bicarbonate will keep falling until it stops falling after three to five days, and it'll be at roughly 10 from its original level or 15. It'll you can tell the resident it's going to fall to 15 from what it is today. So this is an example where you can be fooled into thinking there's a mixed disorder, but it's still only one disorder. You just haven't waited long enough. Okay, here's another patient, an 18-year-old male who was found to be unconscious. And again, commit yourself to what's going on. And again, approach it the same way. It's one of three acid-based disorders and try to then predict for each of those what the change in bicarbonate versus change in the PCO2 should be and see if it fits in any of the three. Do not look at the pH. And again, we'll assume that the bicarbonate started at 25 and the PCO2 started at 40. We don't know that, but we'll assume that. Okay, does anyone want to take a stab at that? It, it helps to take a stab at it because yeah, when you do that... So I think going, well, first I looked at the bicarb with the 33. That doesn't look like the compensation is appropriate with the CO2. Um, so then moving well, on to the PCO. Acid -based, or which acid base? Well, first mention the three acid base disorders. Sure. So I don't think it's a metabolic acidosis. Um, it looks like it could be a metabolic alkalosis. Okay. If so it's the bicarbonate is elevated. That's the first thing. Yep. So the bicarbonate is elevated, so it would be a metabolic alkalosis um, in in that scenario. Um, but then the compensation of the CO two is not appropriate for that. Okay, what should um, it be? That's correct. So if it's eight, so typically it should be, I would say, ooh, probably up to a bite around twenty, right? Looking at the winters, I think not winters. I'm sorry. Um, if we're just going up by four, it would be ten to sixty. I would say. Yeah, so so in metabolic alkalosis, for every 10 increase in the bicarbonate, the PCO2 goes up 7. So it's 7 tenths. So if the bicarbonate went from 25 to 33, then it should be up by 5.6, right? Yep. 70% of 8 is 5.6. So it should be 45.6. That's the maximum the PCO2 can be as a compensation and obviously it's not it's 80 yep so this cannot be a compensated metabolic alkalosis okay keep going um so then moving on looking at the co2 of 80 i would think it's probably a respiratory acidosis um looking at the bicarb post that with it being up 40 i would say that um, an increase, it would be, I guess, an increase double with eight. So this could be compensated. Um, it could be respiratory acidosis with compensated metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so a few things. 
uh, remember that um, those three choices are only three choices. So if the bicarbonate's elevated, there are no other choices other than it's a metabolic alkalosis or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. Yep. Those are the terms. Uh, we do not call um, the elevated bicarbonate that occurs over days here a compensation. And we don't mm. call and we don't call it a metabolic alkalosis. Right? We just have two terms for respiratory acidosis. It's either acute or chronic. And if it's and if the bicarb is not what's expected for these two, then you're just not in a steady state. So let's go back to there. So again, when the bicarb's elevated, your brain immediately goes, if someone asks you, this is metabolic alkalosis or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. That's that's what you need to say. And again, to distinguish them, you look at the changes. So for metabolic alkalosis, the bicarb went up by eight. The PCO2 should go up 70% of that. It's seven to 10. So it means 5.6. If it started at 40, it would be roughly 45, 46. It's clearly not. So this cannot be a compensated metabolic alkalosis. Now here we can use the word compensated because we only use the word compensated in the metabolic acid-based disorders. Okay, so this cannot be a compensated metabolic alkalosis. It's got to be something else. Is it acute respiratory acidosis? Well, for every 10 increase in the PCO2, right, let's go back to the slide. Sorry, went the wrong way here. For every 10 increase in the PCO2, the bicarb goes up one. Whereas if it's chronic, which means a new steady state has been achieved after three to five days, the total increase would be 3.5. It goes up another two and a half. So let's look at our numbers here. For every 10 increase in the PCO2, this should go up by one. If it's if it just happened, this went up. This went up by forty. Mm. So the most this can go up is four. It would be twenty nine. So these numbers do not fit an acute respiratory acidosis either. So now we've ruled out metabolic alkalosis compensated, and we've ruled out acute respiratory acidosis. Now could it be chronic respiratory acidosis? Well. For that to be true, then for every 10 increase in the PCO2, this would have had to gone up three and a half. Okay, so this went up by 40. So this would have had to have gone up by 14. Yep. And it's not 14 plus 25 is 39. So it didn't go up enough to make it chronic respiratory acidosis and it's above acute respiratory acidosis. So again, it's sort of in between. And when you see that, you sort of wonder again, is this just, we haven't reached the, the chronic respiratory acidosis yet. We just haven't waited long enough. And this is, again, another example of that, where if it was acute, it would be here, 29, the bicarbonate, if this went up by 40. This should go up by four and chronically it should be up by 14 this should be 14 plus 25 is 39 and it's not it's 33 it's sitting somewhere over here so one possibility is we're just not at a steady state the other possibility is we have a mixed disorder in other words this could be a chronic respiratory acidosis and the bicarbonate is not 39 because we also have a metabolic acidosis Right, that's what a lot of people would say. That you have a mixed acid-based disorder, you have a chronic. You have, let's say, someone with COPD who developed diarrhea. They would have these numbers. So, before you find your mind diagnosing 
more than one acid-base disorder, you always need to rule out that you haven't reached a steady state with one acid-base disorder. It's very, very important. And fellows make that mistake all the time, not just the fellows, the attendings do all the time. You have to wait long enough before you can say, okay, I should have had a, a steady state by now and the numbers still don't fit what I predict for the steady state. Therefore, I'll now think further and hypothesize another acid-base disorder. So basically, conceptually, you're trying to figure out why the bicarbonate is not as increased as you would predict for a chronic respiratory acidosis. Is it because you haven't waited long enough or you have waited long enough, but there's a metabolic acidosis present dropping the bicarbonate from 39 to 33? Okay, and it must be non-anion gap because you don't have an elevated anion gap. So if it is a metabolic acidosis, it's hyperchloremic or non-gap. But again, you wouldn't think in those terms until you've ruled out that this has not been going on long enough. And so what you would tell the resident is, let's just wait. If, 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 if the discussion is what's the acid-base disorder going on here or disorders, if that's the question, the answer is to wait that this looks like because the patient was unconscious, we don't have any other reason clinically for a metabolic acid-based disorder. My guess would be this is all respiratory, but then why isn't it acute or chronic? Well, the answer is it's somewhere in between. Remember that the acute and chronic are just the extremes. We don't clinically have, unfortunately, names for everything in between, even though it's still respiratory acidosis, we don't have a term for it. We only have a term for the beginning and the end. If it's in the middle, we just say respiratory acidosis between acute and chronic or respiratory acidosis, and we're not in a new steady state. We're on the way to chronic, but we haven't gotten there yet. We don't really have good clinical terms for that. And you can use any of those, but the, but the point is wait. And over the next two or three days, every, every day you're gonna see this number going up and you, can tell the resident you predict it'll flatten out by time it gets to 38, 39, assuming the PCO2 is being kept at 80. If the PCO2 is being changed, then you're dealing with a lot of complexity because you keep driving the system up and down based on what this is. You're never going to reach anything predictable. So you can only make predictions here if one of the numbers stays constant. And again, we've done all of this without even looking at what the pH is. And it's important because had we done that, we would be potentially very confused. And we certainly would not be able to, based on this, come up with the analysis we just did. We would think it's respiratory acidosis, but we wouldn't really intuitively understand what's going on or where we are or make the recommendation to wait. So again, if it's acute, we would expect this 10 to one, and if it's chronic, 10 to 3.5. So the total PCO2 change was 40. So this would be expected to change by four. And if it's chronic, this would be expected to change by 14. And our numbers is, is in between. You know, we've changed by eight. So it's not this or this. And again, we don't have a term for it. We're on the way to becoming this, assuming everything else stays the same. So again, another example of a single acid-base disorder where we didn't achieve a steady state and that's why it looks more complicated. Okay, here's a 60-year-old male with an acute MI who's hypotensive and the bicarbonate and total CO2 are down. We calculate the anion gap here. So this would be 121. So the anion gap is about 23. So it's we don't know what the original anion gap is. We don't know what the albumin is. We don't know what type of machine the hospital is using. So we don't know if the chlorides are measured higher. But we'll assume, because we have none of this information, that the anion gap is normally 10 or 11. But again, this is an assumption. The best thing is to know what the patient was before. There's also some pre-renal failure, it looks like. The BUN is elevated out of proportion to the creatinine. So this is most likely decreased cardiac output. The kidney's not getting perfused normally. And just looking at this, we would think there's lactate floating around without thinking too much further. 
the potassium's up probably because of the acidemia, whether there's decreased renal excretion of potassium also because of the decreased GFR, possible to say. Okay, so now we look at the bicarbonate. It's down by about 10. Total CO2 is down about 9 or 10. So we have a decrement in the bicarbonate. And again, we only think of one of the three things on that slide. This is either metabolic. And again, don't look at the, we don't look at the pH. Bicarbonate is down, so it's either a metabolic acidosis or acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis. To distinguish them, we look at how much this has fallen from its original level and compare it to how much the PCO2 has fallen from its original level. If it's a compensated metabolic acidosis, the changes in these things should be roughly equal, which means we'd expect the PCO2 to be 30, and it's not. So this cannot be a compensated metabolic acidosis. Is it acute respiratory alkalosis? Well, for every 10 fall in the PCO2, the bicarbonate falls about two, one to two, same sort of thing as the respiratory acidosis. So if the PCO2 fell by five, we'd expect the bicarbonate to fall by 0.5 to one, very small change roughly two tenths of whatever the PCO2 fell. So it should fall by about one, which means the bicarbonate should be 24. And it's not, it's 15. So this is not compatible with acute respiratory alkalosis either. Is it compatible with chronic respiratory alkalosis? Remember, it's the ratio is two to one. For every 10 fall on the PCO2, the bicarbonate falls by five. So this fell by five, this should be down two and a half. So it's not compatible with chronic respiratory alkalosis either. Now, clinically, we would think we're not dealing. So now we look at the clinical to see, are there more clues? We don't do the clinical. Don't let your mind look at anything clinically until you first analyze the three choices from a, from a chemistry or a numerical point of view. Don't bounce back and forth between the clinical and the numbers. Just stick with one of the it's one of the three choices from an acid base point of view, ignoring what's going on clinically. Now, one clue here is from the numbers also is we have an elevated anion gap. So the elevated anion gap means if that we're dealing with a metabolic acidosis at least. And then knowing that, we look at the clinical and we see from the clinical that the clinical is really compatible with a metabolic acidosis, anion gap type metabolic acidosis. There's not really any clue here that we're dealing with acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis. We don't have a cirrhotic patient. We don't have a woman in the third trimester of pregnancy. We don't have anyone living at high altitude. We don't have anyone on a ventilator. There's really no good clinical reason for someone hyperventilating. So, we're left with this question as to why, if this is an anion gap metabolic acidosis, is the PCO2 not down by roughly what the bicarbonate fell? Because we would expect this PCO2 to be about 30 if it's compensated appropriately. And again, what we're dealing with here is we're not in a steady state. Remember that We'll go back to the times things take. It takes 11 to 24 hours for that PCO2 to reach a decrement that equals the fallen bicarbonate. So we have the MI, we have a lactic acidosis, we have hypoperfusion. That bicarbonate's going to fall, you know, very quickly, depending on the proton load that's coming with, uh, with the lactate. But the PCO2 as a compensation, our ventilatory response doesn't occur instantaneously. It takes half a day to a day. And so all that's happened here is that the PCO2 hasn't had a chance, or the ventilatory system hasn't had a chance to reach its maximum in this metabolic condition and drive the PCO2 down to 30. You're somewhere in between. You're probably in the first couple of hours or so, or less, you know, less, less than half a day or something like that. Uh, it takes at least half a day 
for this to reach 30. And remember, it can be anything in between until you've reached a new steady state. So what, again, what you would tell the resident here is, well, what some people might say is, this is an anion gap metabolic acidosis and the PCO2 should be 30 if it's compensated. The fact that it's 35 means you have a respiratory acidosis in addition. That would be sort of the typical response, someone who is thinking clearly. Remember, the lack of an appropriate response, assuming you've reached a steady state, means you have a respiratory acid-based disorder in addition. And that sort of confuses people. So let's say we did, let's say this was two days later. So plenty of time for the compensation to reach the one-to-one -one predicted amount. Plenty of time for the PCO2 to reach 30, but it's sticking at 35. Well, then you truly do have an additional acid-based disorder. Remember that the lack of the predicted compensation in metabolic acidosis or alkalosis, by definition, is means you have a respiratory acid-based disorder in addition. So in metabolic acidosis, the PCO2 falls. If the PCO2 did not fall enough, by definition, you have a ventilation problem. And that's not what you say when you're, I mean, that's what you say physiologically, perhaps. But the correlate of that, as far as acid-base diagnosis, is that the PCO2 is higher than you would expect, and we call that a respiratory acidosis. You don't need to use the word superimposed. That doesn't add anything. You just say, my patient has an anion gap metabolic acidosis, and they also have, at the same time, a respiratory acidosis. Now, why they have that? Now, that confuses people. How can you have a respiratory acidosis when the PCO2 is below 40? And the answer is it should be 30. The compensation demands that it be 30. If you have a normal medulla and your lungs are normal, you're going to ventilate spontaneously such that after about a day, your PCO2 is going to be 30 on average. And if it's above 30, that becomes respiratory acidosis. That's the teaching point. Anything above 30, not anything above 40 like it is in a normal person. But in this situation, anything above 30 is abnormally low ventilation. So if it's 35, 34, 36, 37, that's respiratory acidosis. Now, clearly, if it was 40 and nothing happened to the ventilation, that would be easier. You'd say, yeah, the patient has a respiratory acidosis. But the teaching point is, until it reaches 30, everything above 30 is called a respiratory acidosis. If it's 32, 33, it's still a respiratory acidosis. Now, with the proviso that we waited long enough for the compensation to occur. In this patient, we didn't. We're still within the, the time frame after the uh, acute MI. And so what's happening to this patient is we just haven't waited long enough for the Winters formula to take place or for the simpler rule of one-to-one, -one, if you want to use that, which I prefer. Uh, you just haven't waited long enough, and that's why the PCO2 is still elevated. It's not because the patient has a ventilatory problem. And that's the important point to realize, because when you say the patient has a respiratory acidosis in addition, you're telling another doctor they have a, there's something wrong with their ventilation. Whereas in this particular patient, where you haven't waited long enough for the full compensation to occur, there's nothing wrong with their ventilation. You and I would have the same thing occur. You just have to wait long enough to get the predicted change in their ventilation. And that takes, as I said, about half a day to a day. So uh, in today's talk, I just wanted to give you examples of patients who appear to have a mixed acid-base disorder, meaning that it didn't fall into one of the three choices for each of those changes in bicarbonate, the three choices if it's up and the three choices if it's down. It didn't fall into one of those three choices, but it didn't fall not because there's an additional acid-base disorder, but because you did, the, the time frame wasn't long enough to achieve the full compensatory response. So I think I'll stop there. And if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to unmute. Okay, well, I hope I hope that was clear. It's something you really need to consider on the ward that uh, most people don't consider. When you have something that doesn't look like a simple acid-base disorder, your immediate thought should be, did we wait long enough? It's like a trigger.
don't start looking at other potential causes and make the situation more complex than it is. And also for teaching the house staff, it's a very nice thing when you can say to them, let's just wait another couple of days, we'll repeat the numbers. And I, and then you tell them, I predict that, you know, the bicarbonate will be this or that. And they're very surprised when you're right. So we'll leave it at there and uh, have a great rest of the day, everybody.